As frustration grows with American politics, there may be a new way to select presidential candidates. We'll talk about that next on Global Perspectives. This program is made possible in part by funding from the UCF Global Perspectives Office, the Global Connections Foundation, and the India Program at UCF. This is Global Perspectives with Pulitzer Prize winning commentator John Bercia, Special Assistant to the President for Global Perspectives at the University of Central Florida. Hello and welcome to Global Perspectives. To many Americans, the U.S. political system appears dysfunctional with partisanship at an all-time high. Recent fighting between Republicans and Democrats over the debt ceiling and budgets almost brought our government and the economy to a crashing halt. With our economy continuing to struggle and our political system constantly under the threat of gridlock, what can Americans expect from the outcome of the 2012 elections? More of the same? Or is there another option? One group, Americans Elect, thinks it has the answer. Elliot Ackerman serves as Chief Operating Officer of this nonprofit organization, which is not affiliated with any candidate or party. It is inviting every registered voter in the United States to participate in a nonpartisan process to nominate candidates for the 2012 presidential election using the internet. Thanks for joining us, Mr. Ackerman. And thanks so much for having me, John. Tell us a little bit about how Americans Elect got started. What, what motivated it? Who were the people there at the beginning? And how did you get involved? Sure. Well, Americans Elect, sort of the, the initial idea of, you know, could we have a nonpartisan nominating convention to get us away from the hyperpartisanship that exists in our government right now? Because we know that you, know, you have the far right and the far left of the two major parties is, is where our candidates get nominated from. And you govern to the area where you're elected from. But what if people didn't get have, have to get elected from the far right or the far left? You know, that was sort of the seed idea. And two of the, uh, I guess, intellectual folks who uh, conceptualized this were a gentleman named Doug Bailey, who ran Ford's campaign, and a gentleman named Ham Jordan, who ran Carter's campaign. And they kind of conceived of this idea, a nonpartisan convention. So the idea came forward in 2008 with an initiative called Unity 08. And Unity 08 went forward to the Federal Election Commission and asked, you know, what are we? Because we're, we're not a new political party. We're trying to, to select our leaders in a, in a different way. And the Federal Election Commission came back to Unity and said, well, actually, we'll tell you what you are. And keep in mind, the Federal Election Commission, uh, by law and practice, is made up of three Democrats and three Republicans. They said, we'll tell you what you are. You're a minor party. And as a minor party, they put great restrictions on the amount of money that that effort was able to raise and made it impossible for them to gather the resources to get on the ballot in all 50 states. And ultimately, that initiative died. But the FEC's ruling was then challenged in the courts made it all the way up to the district appellate court uh, with a great lawyer, uh, a woman named Alessandra Shapiro, who took it on pro bono, and it was overturned. And the district appellate court ruled that you could have a second nominating process as long as that process didn't espouse any specific policy positions and didn't give preferential treatment to any candidates. And so really that's where Americans Elect was born. That sounds like a, a totally novel concept, something that is not a party that does not have a particular orientation, um, but how do you get p the average person past thinking of you as a party? Because right. that's almost automatically the response. You know, it's and it's funny you say it's a it's a novel concept. Uh, and if you go back, it's it's actually not that novel because this is the original vision that our founding fathers had for the country. Let's keep in mind, you know, nowhere in our founding documents are the two major parties mentioned. If anything, you know, Washington in his farewell address. Uh, James Madison and Federalist 10, they warn about the deleterious effects, what they called them factions, what parties could have on our political structure. Their vision was that nothing would stand between the people and their elected leaders. So we're in effect doing, by having a second nominating process and leveraging the internet and social media to do that, is we're making it so the people have much more of a direct role in how we nominate our leaders and removing some of the structures that exist today uh, of party getting in between them. You know, for instance, that only registered members of the party get to have a voice. Why can't every registered voter have a voice? Uh -huh. 
but you needed technology to catch up with the process because as we were saying earlier, it, it wouldn't have been likely that something like this could have been exactly. tried, uh, you know, at least in the way the founding fathers envisioned it. Right, and so what, what we're doing is we're, we're using our technology and innovation to get us back to many of these oldest values that we had in our country and to, and to get rid of some of the causes of hyper-partisanship that are leaving, leading to, uh, to complete gridlock in the way we govern right now. So how did you start? What, what was the first step? What was the first state you approached? Well, we started with some, a few smaller states to see what the appetite was. Uh, obviously, ballot access is a big hurdle here. And really, the, the big innovation that's occurring here, right, is we get a lot of folks uh, who see the pattern recognition. They say, oh, Americans elect this is another third party. We've seen this before. We saw, we saw Ross Perot, and you know, we remember when Mayor Bloomberg was thinking about running. Uh, but if you look in all those cases, it was an individual who had the resource going about and getting ballot access for themselves and then appending a party uh, onto their personage. So to say it was a third party is kind of a misnomer. The real innovation that's occurring here, it's the first time 50 state ballot access will be acquired for a ticket to be directly named by the American people. So we went to a few smaller states, uh, went to Nevada, Alaska, Arizona, to see what the appetite was for this. And it was, it was sizable. We saw people signing up in, in really record numbers. More than 70% of the folks that we approached signed up and said they wanted a third ticket on the ballot in 2012 that they would be able to select. And then we went into the mother of them all, which is California. You need 2.9 million signatures across the entire country to get on the ballot. And to date, we've gathered nearly 2 million. Of those 2.9 million, 1.6 of them are in California. So. You know, we didn't want to have a big press conference and announce that we were going to be doing this. We just wanted to take this to the American people and, and see if they, if they wanted more of a voice and a third choice in 2012. And we saw them signing up in record numbers in California. We've completed the gathering of 1.6 million signatures there, which make it the largest signature gathering initiative in the history of that state. And we're pretty sure in the history of the country. And just to give you a sense of that, John, you need 800,000 signatures to change the constitution of the state of California. This is twice as much just to get another choice on the ballot. Well, I think you've tapped into something because many Americans are tired of mm -hmm. the, the fighting that's going on in the political system today. So many don't vote. And of those who vote, oftentimes it's done with, you know, with their nose closed right. uh, because they, they just don't really like the choices. But mm -hmm. you have to vote for someone. Right. And if we look at it right now, you know, the Internet, social media, they've flattened every other facet of our life, presented with infinite choices. Our politics is the only area of our life where we still have to choose between brand A and brand B. And most folks have a more nuanced political identity than just you know, the Republican Party on the one hand, the Democratic Party on the other. So let's allow them to express themselves in a more nuanced way politically. And what we're doing is it's not antithetical to the two parties. The two parties have served our nation well for many, many years, and I believe will continue to do so. But what we're really doing is untethering the two parties from the far right and the far left and allowing them to, to really reach across the political space. Let's get candidates that can now run in a more authentic way, one that's really focused on finding solutions to some of the crucial issues that are facing our country. As you build momentum, will the, the two main parties become obstacles to what you're trying to do, or do you sense that you'll be welcomed into the, into the mix? Well, I think what we're going to see is a much more lively competition that will occur in 2012. Uh, right now, the competition we have coming out before us is somewhat analog. We have uh, the ideology of the far left against the ideology of the far right. What if there was a candidate that could exist somewhere in this huge space in the center? What if there's someone who could put forward creative ideas that took the best of the Republican Party and Democratic Party's ideas and could run authentically on those ideas. I think it would not only be something that Americans are craving, but would elevate the entire debate. I think what a lot of Americans are frustrated right now is we're having a political discourse that's it's ultimately beneath us as a people. We as a people are greater than the political discourse that's occurring in this country right now. I'm, I'm curious as to how you advance candidates using this process because if, if people just say, what, what if there's a large number that says, I want X person, but X person isn't interested right. in, in running? H how do you s sort of narrow the list? Well, I mentioned that you know, the real political innovation that's going on here is 50 state ballot access uh, for a convention that every registered voter can participate in. 
So because we're having this convention, we're able to reimagine what this part of our democracy looks like. And Americans elect, we're taking what have traditionally been the functions of the parties, we're making them the functions of the delegates. And a delegate is any registered voter who comes to Americans elect. And we're doing that in three areas. So delegates will be able to discuss and debate the rules of the convention. They'll be able to develop a platform of questions that every candidate has to answer as a requirement for their candidacy. As I mentioned before, we don't have any issues that we espouse, but the delegates have questions, questions they want their candidates to answer. And last, and directly to your point, in terms of how do the candidates emerge, delegates will be able to draft candidates through Americans Elect into our convention. So we'll have some candidates who announce and say they want to run through Americans Elect, but what we're also going to see is draft movements where everyday Americans are able, leveraging this platform in Americans Elect, to push forward some of the best Americans in our society, start draft movements for them so that when we go into our convention, how does it change somebody's political calculation of, well, you know, I wasn't thinking about running. But what if 10 or 15 million Americans have come online supporting that individual, calling for them to run, and all they have to do is accept that nomination at the end of the day? Do you have any sense yet of the kinds of issues that will be prominent? Mm -hmm. I know Americans seem to be most concerned about issues that right. are closer to home, so it's the economy, mm -hmm. it's taxes, et cetera. But uh, what, what is your reading so far of what some of the issues might be? Right. Well, if you go to americanselect.org, you'll see that one of the first things what we ask you to do when you sign up to become a delegate is to weigh and prioritize the issues, what you feel the crucial issues are facing our country. Uh, and to date, we've had over 5 million questions answered online, and we have over 100,000 delegates who are participating. And uh, what we're seeing is, is actually somewhat, somewhat predictable. The economy is obviously a real hot button issue right now. Education, health care, our foreign policy. And uh, the way people are responding to these questions is we're finding that there's a lot of people who are engaged on this site who are uh, socially liberal, economically conservative, don't seem to have uh, a home or to be represented in the two major parties. Uh, and so they're coming to Americans elect to have more of a voice and to be more active in the way we select our leaders. What, what specifically is of interest in the foreign policy area? You come from a foreign affairs background. You've had a lot of mm -hmm. experience in other countries. Um, is there anything there that's starting to gel yet? Well, I think people want to discuss foreign policy as a real issue in this election. I think we'll, you know, if we look just this cycle, there hasn't been a lot of uh, talk about what our policy is going to be going forward uh, in the two major theaters of war in Iraq and Afghanistan. It seems to be a politically neutral issue that everyone's staying away from, but it obviously links in substantively to many of the other issues we're facing in this country, especially in terms of our economy. So let's, let's get a real discussion going about what our footing should be uh, in our two wars. What, what, what is next? As, uh, you're, you're already in Florida, right. uh, approved in Florida. Uh, how many more states do you have to go? Well, we have, uh, in 2011, we're going to be on the ballot in 28 states plus the District of Columbia. We're going as fast as we can. Uh, so we're getting 28 plus D.C. in 2011 because you're only allowed to do that many in 2011. The other 22, by law, we're not allowed to go into in 2012, but we'll be going into those states in 2012. And uh, we're going to continue uh, gathering those signatures. But again, we've made great headway. We've got nearly 2 million of the 2.9 million that we need. So we've really broken the back of uh, our signature gathering initiatives. Uh, so we're going to be on the ballot in all 50 states in 2012. And uh, you know, it's going to be a three horse race. And the American people are going to have a direct voice in nominating that third ticket. So what is your ideal scenario by summer 2012 uh, once your convention is is completed. Right. Well, I think we're going to see a really unique process occurring in our democracy. I think it's, I think it's great that, uh, that we're having what is a true political innovation go on right now. And I think it's nothing more fitting. You know, in the United States, we say that you know, we outsource a lot of our industries, but the one thing we never outsource is innovation. And uh, how fitting it is that the one thing we don't outsource is innovation in our democracy. So in 2012, we'll see a third ticket emerge. That ticket will have been debuted in a truly national primary that every American can run in. And that ticket will be moving headfirst into the uh, presidential election in November 2012. That ticket will be in the debates uh, in the fall of 2012. And, uh, and I think this is going to be a great step forward for our democracy and get us away from some of the hyperpartisanship that has frozen our governance. Now you, you mentioned when you first started exploring this concept, what some of the financial hurdles were. Mm -hmm. Um, now that you're in motion, I'm sure they're still there. Uh, how, how did you plan 
and strategize financially to get started, and how is that working now? Right, well, when we started this process, obviously, as I mentioned, it, it, it takes a uh, you know, significant seed money to be able to get on the ballot in all 50 states uh, in terms of the legal fees and uh, and really building enough of an organization that can go do that. You know, we also have a website, americanselect.org, that's getting folks involved. But our vision is we want this to be something that's wholly owned by the American people. So uh, we're inviting folks to come and provide small contributions uh, to really take this thing over and make it their own so that going forward, American Select really can be a self-correcting mechanism in our democracy that if we ever get too far out on the right or too far out on the left, everybody in here has got a tool to self-correct and bring people back uh, into a more reasonable political space. And ideally, that funding will be sufficient to keep you moving, but I, I read that you also have received loans from individuals. Right. So as I mentioned, the, uh, the initial funding, we didn't want to be in a scenario when this thing was playing out that uh, you know, some of our, you know, like any business, you go to the bank to get your initial money, but we didn't want a few individuals to, to have more equity in this than anybody else. So they gave their money as loans. So as individuals come and they give small donations, all those loans paid out. And our vision is that the average donation for Americans elect will be $100 by the time we have our convention, and it will be wholly funded by, uh, by small contributions. Mm -hmm. And what we're funding here is a website, and 50 state ballot access. This whole initiative, you know, compared to the Goliath $1 billion campaigns of the two major parties, we're about 1 60th of that. Uh, and we're running, in, we're running in a new way. Uh, you don't need a billion dollars to run a presidential campaign. And we're going to be leveraging all of these tools in social media, earn media, uh, to really have a candidate who can run in a more authentic way and not be anchored to the special interests of the far right or the far left. How do you respond to naysayers who might suggest, well, I don't know you, mm -hmm. but I know the Republicans, I know the Democrats, I may not like everything they do, but at least they're familiar. Mm -hmm. How do you persuade somebody that you're something legitimate that sure. will, will help the system? Well, I'll invite them to come to americaselect.org and see what we're talking about. What's getting talked about on the site is the crucial issues facing the country. Uh, this is something that's only going to work if people get involved. Uh, and you'll see, as you answer those questions, you get to see what Americans from across the country, how they answer these questions. And we're really having a dialogue about how to get our governance back on track and how to solve a lot of the problems we're facing as a people. How has the political science community responded to you? Because the, the, the specialists who mm -hmm. monitor elections and campaigns and things like that, have mm -hmm. they started incorporating you into their assessments? Or are um, they still cautiously observing what's happening. Sure. You know, I think there's a lot of discussion and debate right now in the political science community about how to get our governance back on track. Uh, you know, if you look at it right now, you know, the amount of members of Congress who are able to defect across the aisle and vote with the other side, I mean, is at historical lows. And there's a lot of debate in the political science community about whether that's going to be sustainable within our democracy. Uh, and many are very interested in what we're trying to do. We're trying to jumpstart our systems of governance so that people can be encouraged for, uh, or rewarded for reaching across the political space instead of getting primaried. I think there's a lot of concern that we've a verb to get primaried in our political vocabulary. That means, you know, primary means that a small number of voters is able to remove a choice from the ballot because, because that individual doesn't meet some type of ideological litmus test in terms of their purity. It's, it's undemocratic and you wind up with a system of governance where you have a tyranny of the minority over the majority. Mm -hmm. It seems if you're changing and re-energizing the, the, the process, it could lead to greater voter participation. Is that mm -hmm. something you're expecting? Absolutely. Uh, you have to be a registered voter to participate in American Select, and we encourage uh, the individuals who come to our site to go register to vote and participate in a more meaningful way. Uh, you know, again, people don't expect to only have to choose between brand A and brand B in one of the most important facets of our life, which is our political life. So let's get folks engaged. Let's give, let's give the individual citizen more power to really have a voice in our political debate. You know, it's just, this is the United States. People shouldn't be closed out necessarily because they aren't firmly anchored in one party or another. The two parties have served us well and they can continue to serve us well, but, uh, but let's let them Let's let them de-anchor from their bases and come, come more towards the center, more where the majority of Americans are.
It's good for the country. When I go to the ballot box, one of my main concerns is that what I'm doing is private and that my vote is going to be safe and secure. Mm -hmm. what, what kinds of safety and security measures have you built into this process so that voting online is just as legitimate as voting at a polling station? Right, absolutely. The, uh, well, we're very fortunate. Our chief technology officer is actually the perfect guy to be leading this effort. Uh, he's a gentleman named Josh Levine, and he was the chief technology officer for E-Trade from 1999 to 2006. And we do so much of our life online uh, to include Josh's expertise, which was online banking. Uh, and he'd be the first one to tell you that when he started this, people never thought you could securely bank online. And we do that all the time now. So we've got some of the best experts in the field making sure that this is a completely secure process. Mm -hmm. Now, let's, let's assume you're successful mm -hmm. and you win. Yeah. How does that work with the parties that are in place in the Congress and the importance of coalition building sure. and all of that? How does your mm -hmm. third candidate work with these? Right groups. Well, remember we mentioned that we're not a third party because the ticket that can come out of this can be a Republican, it can be a Democrat, it can be an Independent. Again, the ticket that comes out of this, though, it can't be two R's running together, two D's running together. You know, we have the two major parties for that. But let's say it's a Republican with an Independent. Well, that Republican would still be the head of the Republican Party. But now we have a head of the party who's been elected by seeking this constituency that's not at the far right or the far left really providing incentives for people to be in this center space, encouraging compromise and, quite frankly, rewarding it, rewarding the two ideological bases of our political society to work together, whereas right now they're punished for it. As we mentioned before, they're primaried for it. Mm -hmm. um, so this really changes the incentive structure for not only how individuals are elected, but how they're governed. So if you change the way we elect our officials, you also change the way they govern. Does the response to Americans elect vary by age. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious as to whether you're more enthusiastically embraced by older registered voters or younger registered voters right. or, or, or if it's all the same because people are tired of what's happening in the system. You know, John, it's, it's been interesting. Uh, I think initially folks would say, you know, this is something that's, that's going on online and, uh, you know, naturally say, oh, I bet this is something that's only going to be attractive with, you know, 20-somethings and 30-somethings. Uh, and we found that that component, that having, having more choice, having a, a more vibrant political experience is something that's very appealing to those folks. But we've also found, very interestingly, that it's, it's very appealing for, for older voters as well, folks between 50 and 65, and so much as, you know, these are individuals who've, who've been in the, they've seen the political system play out over years, and they've seen in the last two decades every conceivable permutation of political leadership, a, a Republican executive and all Republican Congress, a Democratic executive and a, and a Republican Congress, and flip-flop. They've seen like a slot machine, you know, it go every single way, and they've continued to see gridlock and a lack of real solutions-based government, uh, inability of the parties to put the interests of the American people ahead of the interests of the two major parties and they want to change, they want to see some solutions come down the pike, and, uh, and, and, and they're interested uh, in getting involved, so that's been great too. I imagine you have quite a bit of travel in your immediate future. Are you going to be personally visiting every state where you're trying to get this on the ballot? Yeah, we, we, uh, we, we travel all around, so it's, you know, it's great to be here with you in, uh, in Florida today. Uh, I was up in Michigan recently, Nevada, California, so uh, we're traveling across the country spreading the word and getting folks involved and it's, 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 been, a, you know, it's been a privilege to get to talk to people about this new idea and, uh, and, see, and see them coming out for it. And at this point you're really optimistic about the possibilities. Yeah, I, you know, aren't we, I think aren't we all going to vote this way someday? You know, the fact is that the internet, social media has broken down every single barrier to entry and other, every other facet of our lives except for our political lives. So there's no reason why I won't do the same in our political lives. And Americans elect is an important step forward in that, uh, in that journey. Good. Well, thank you for joining us today, Mr. Ackerman. Hey, thanks so much for having me, John. And thank you for the Global Perspective Show. I'm John Bercia. We'll see you next time. This program is made possible in part by funding from the UCF Global Perspectives Office, the Global Connections Foundation, and the India Program at UCF.